Welcome back. You're watching our special G20 broadcast from the Bharat Mandapam. We're joining you from the Crafts Pavilion here at uh, ITPO, the Pragati Medan. Behind me is uh, the Goddess Durga statue. This is from Odisha. It's been made from wood. Uh, you might be seeing a lot of pictures of the Nagraj statue, the 24-foot Nagraj statue at the Bharat Mandapam. We can't ac access that. That's uh, known to be very beautiful and one of the key attractions here. But there's actually a lot for uh, foreign leaders and media delegates and delegates from different countries to visit and witness uh, and just understand what Indian culture stands for, what are the kind of products that uh, come from different parts of the country. And just uh, behind me is the RBI Pavilion as well. But uh, without wasting any more time, let me go across to Suman Sinha uh, of Renew, Renew Power. Suman Sinha, Thank you very much for uh, joining us at this point. Let me begin by asking you about the Global Biofuel Alliance. This is going to be announced this uh, evening at around 5 p.m. What will be the importance of this alliance according to you? You know, I, I think first of all, <clears throat> to take that into context, the, the reality is that uh, as, a, as a globe, we're just simply not doing enough on climate change. I think that is very clear. Uh, today, the UNFCC Global Stock Take Report also came out. And that also shows that the world is just simply not moving at the pace that it was intended at the Paris Climate Accords. So much more needs to be done. Now, in, in doing much more, we have to really pursue each and every possibility that we have. Biofuels is actually a very good way for us to generate renewable uh, energy, which can be used in a number of different applications, including mobility, including uh, certain kinds of uh, shipping fuel and so on. So I think it's very important for us to make sure that we put enough focus and emph emphasis behind it to make sure that we are able to uh, essentially get more biofuels into the system and are able to develop user industries that are then able to absorb all that biofuel. So I think a lot of effort needs to be put into that uh, to make sure that, again, we move more and more towards renewable energy as we go forward. So getting that kind of a, uh, alliance together, I think, is very important. Okay, and the Prime Minister in his blog, uh, Sumanth, had also spoken about how a global ecosystem for green hydrogen would emerge out of this G20 meeting. Uh, how do you see that coming about? Because we've had a, G uh, a green hydrogen program, uh, a major green hydrogen mission worth 19,000 crore rupees. That's being rolled out currently. So what kind of G20 green hydrogen system are we looking at from the summit? Well, again, very important, prediction to look at fundamentally why we need green hydrogen in the system. Uh, today, the world makes about 100 million tons of hydrogen from gray sources, which is highly polluting, right? As, and this hydrogen is used as a feedstock into industries like refineries, uh, fertilizers, uh, 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 and so on. And that has to be changed because we cannot continue to emit methane that is formed by making this hydrogen into the atmosphere. It's extremely polluting. The second thing is, that there are a number of areas where we can actually substitute fuel with, with hydrogen as a fuel or use derivatives of hydrogen, things like uh, methanol, which can be used in the shipping industry, uh, and then sustainable aviation fuel based on green hydrogen. So green hydrogen essentially is a very critical element in the whole world's decarbonization journey. It's absolutely critical. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a new developing area. And in that, Every country right now has its own thoughts about how to define the, what is green hydrogen, how to uh, what kind of uh, mandates to have for it, and how to trade it across the world. So putting together a green hydrogen alliance and having common definitions of what the, of what green hydrogen is, encouraging it to come up all the you know everywhere across the world is very important. And I think recognizing that the prime minister set a very ambitious target in, for India uh, to get up to about four, five million tons of green hydrogen by 2030. Um, and that is why the National Green Hydrogen Mission has been brought about, uh, investing uh, about two and a half billion dollars over this time period. Now, other countries are actually doing quite a lot as well. And I think it's important for the world to come together, uh, make sure that all of these common elements of what constitutes green hydrogen, how to trade it and so on, uh, is defined well, so that we have the ability of creating a new uh, asset class, a new tradable asset class which can then allow us to move away from uh, fossil fuels, oil and gas, and so on, and more and more towards green fuels. Keep in mind that hydrogen, green hydrogen is made using renewable electricity. That's the core of what it is, and therefore it is clean. And that is why it's important for 
uh, the world to come together to really encourage green hydrogen in a much bigger way. And I'm really glad that India is taking a lead in that whole effort. Right. Right. Uh, uh, Suman Sinha, stay with us. Uh, we just want to recap for our viewers, the leaders who have arrived at Bharat Mandapam so far. Prime Minister of Netherlands, Mark Rutte, Nigerian President Bola Emma Tinubu, Spanish Deputy Prime Minister Nadia Calvino, UAE President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee uh, Sien Long. You also have uh, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez. They've all arrived here. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen is also there. Many important conversations taking place. And uh, let me return to Sumant Sinha, Founder, Chairman and CEO of Renew. Uh, Sumant, I'd like to ask you about the 50-minute bilateral that happened between India and the United States yesterday. Uh, there was also a fund that is going to be set up by both countries for uh, renewable energy and renewable infrastructure as well. What, according to you, were some of the big takeaways from that meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden? What are the next big things that you see the two countries doing together in the field of climate action, uh, energy transition as well? Well, you know, it's absolutely uh, critical for India and the U.S. to cooperate and work very closely with each other in the area of climate change, because we are two of the three largest emitters of carbon in the world. Um, and of course, as you know, as India grows, we will continue to emit more carbon into the atmosphere. And so therefore, we have to follow a path that is less carbon intensive. And I think that's the direction that the Prime Minister has put us on. Now, technologies are absolutely essential in that. Financing is absolutely essential. And both of those are things that the U.S. does have. And therefore, it's very important for us to make sure that we get the best in terms of technology, whether it's for green hydrogen, whether it's for <clears throat> biofuels, whether it's for other areas, and make sure that we are able to incorporate those at a very early stage in India. Now, the, the financing agreement that has been signed between the USDFC, Development Finance Corporation, and NIIF, envisages $500 million from each of the two institutions coming together in a billion dollars to finance infrastructure, climate change infrastructure in the country. And I think that's obviously very important. I think what is going to be very important also is how those, that money is used. Uh, I think just providing loans or equity into projects, I think there's a lot of private capital that is coming in. I think that capital has to be used in a way to catalyze more private investment uh, in the renewable energy sector in the country or to go into areas where uh, it is harder to get private capital to come in. Uh, so I think that's how that capital has to be used. Really should be looked at from a risk capital standpoint. Um, so I think that is very important. The second thing is supply chains, uh, very critical. Today, the world supply chains in renewables are really focused or really concentrated in China. It is important for both the US and India to make sure that these supply chains are diversified into India and into the US. And between India and the US, there is a strong trade that develops in, uh, in um, the supply chain side. So I think those are the two areas that I think we really need to work closely with each other. Uh, and make sure that this partnership uh, develops even more. Uh, welcome. We are joining you from the Bharat Mandapam. And right now, I'm at the RBI Pavilion here in uh, Bharat Mandapam. Remember, there is a country pavilion which showcases products and artifacts from different countries, their art as well. There's a crafts exhibition. And there is an RBI Pavilion which is showing our uh, frictionless credit schemes, our UPI. Uh, all of this is being showcased here. You've got officials from uh, the RBI also there to explain delegates the kind of work we're doing. There is uh, uh, a stall here showcasing India's central bank digital currencies as well. There are RBI officials, officials from different banks in India. So there is an attempt to showcase the India stack to the world. Uh, we will be through the day showcasing what's happening here. There's a digital immersive experience uh, where the Ministry of Electronics and IT is, uh, has also put up a shawl showing the digital innovation we're doing in India. And we are uh, trying to put financial inclusion very strongly in the communique as well. Uh, leaders continue to arrive here at the G20 summit. And we have uh, also seen Georgia Meloni of Italy. We're now seeing uh, the Prime Minister of Tur uh, the, uh, the President of Turkey arrive here as well. He's meeting the Prime Minister right now in front of the Konar wheel. We're waiting for President Biden to arrive, uh, Sergei Lavrov, Premier Li Xiang of China, Rishi Sunak. I can see him right now walking on uh, 
the aisle. This is inside the Bharat Mandapam, which is about 500 meters away from where I am standing. So uh, leaders from Egypt, leaders from Canada, uh, leaders from uh, the European Union, they have already arrived at the venue. Leaders from Saudi Arabia as well. Suman Sinha continues to be with us. Uh, Suman Sinha, what do you think we are able to do or what will be the larger deliverables from the G20? Uh, if, you were to be, uh, if you were to be asked about three key achievements that you would be looking out for, what would those be? Well, you know, Parikshit, first of all, it's terrific to see India really, uh, you know, at this, at this point on the global world stage. Uh, I think it's it's terrific to see the leadership that India is is taking and all the world leaders coming in and being and being received so warmly and in such a in such a nice manner by uh, by the prime minister and the government. So I think that itself, first of all, I think is a win for India because I think it does position India as a leader uh, on the world stage and and uh, I think enhances our voice. Uh, so I think number one, I'd like to see India really emerge as a voice of the global south. Um, and really take on that position. Uh, to give you a quick example, uh, for you know, uh, instance, uh, India is developing a carbon a light growth path, which I think can be a beacon for the rest of the global south. Um, and then, of course, there are many other ways. The 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 the, the, the India stack, for example, can also become uh, a huge uh, benefit to other countries as well. So I think there are ways in which India can really propel and. Uh, it's it's soft power. So I think this is something that is very important. The second thing is certainly, given my background in climate change, I certainly would like to see a much stronger uh, push from G20 on climate change issues. I think there has been a lot of uh, debate about whether there should be a phase down or phase out of whether it should be coal or whether it should be all fossil fuels. India has been pushing for stronger language and including all fossil fuels that has been resisted by certain countries, including Saudi and, and China and so on. So let's see whether there's a consensus on that. Perhaps that then leads to uh, a more uh, stronger effort, multilateral effort after this. Uh, this. The other thing I'd be looking for is a, a much stronger effort around multilateral development bank lending and providing capital into the climate change space, because uh, ultimately multilateral banks have a very important role to play which they have not actually been doing over the last 10, 12 years uh, in climate change. So we need, uh, you know, the report that uh, Mr. N.K. Singh is presenting along with Larry Summers. Uh, how is that implemented? I think that is going to be very key as well to catalyze more private capital to go into the climate change space, which needs trillions of dollars. Uh, so I think that is very important. And then, of course, as we discussed earlier, things around the Global Biofuels Alliance, uh, the, the, uh, the green hydrogen conversations, that need to move forward faster. So I think all of those are very important areas. I, I won't comment on political issues. I won't comment on uh, broader economic matters because those are, uh, you know, uh, uh, other areas. But I just think that on climate change itself, there is a very significant agenda that India can push uh, in the, in the G20 and really leading into COP 28 and in 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 Dubai. Uh, it, this can really become a big springboard uh, in that direction. So I think very important from that standpoint. But I think again to de-emphasize just highlighting India's position uh, in the world and really taking it forward. I think for me, that's one of the biggest wins of this G20. All right, uh, uh, Suman Sinha, we'll come back to you for one final question to sum up the G20 as you see it. Let me go across to Suman Sinha for uh, one final question. Uh, Suman Sinha, the Prime Minister has spoken about the need to raise the ambition on climate finance and transfer of technology to developing countries. Uh, and he's saying that we cannot have a restrictive attitude. We need to be generous in our climate financing goals, in our energy uh, and technology transfer goals as well. So what, according to you, would be the roadmap that the G20 should come up with uh, so that we have an orderly and just energy transition? That's a terrific question, Parikshit. And look, the Prime Minister is absolutely right. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, he's, he's very savvy when it comes to climate change issues. Uh, you know, I think he recognizes how important climate change is, especially for vulnerable countries like India. Uh, and he's trying to galvanize global support towards moving faster behind this whole issue. Now, I don't know, frankly, how much the G20 can do except on really making sure that the multilateral bank financing issue gets addressed as much as possible. And number two, that every country 
agrees to move forward much faster than it is right now. So I think those are the two things that we have to try to move forward <clears throat> and in some ways create moral pressure on countries because, you know, the architecture that the multilateral or the world has agreed to is really that countries are going to move forward on a voluntary basis. Uh, there is going to be no overarching architecture that says that there are targets for every country and, you know, which are binding and that every country therefore has to move forward at that pace. And so therefore we have to move everybody forward gradually by creating moral pressure by pointing out all the climate calamities that are happening, including, for example, warming of the oceans, which are really a, a climate sink, as it were. Uh, and, and those are things that are causing fundamental damage now. Uh, you look at monsoon patterns, for example, in India, which are getting disrupted, uh, which impacts you know almost 1.4 billion people in the country. So I think what we really require from this G20 is, uh, as, as the prime minister is going to do, discuss around, you know, in the One Earth uh, theme, which is happening today, the whole issue of climate change and how countries need to do a lot more. They need to open their purse strings. The long promised climate financing that was supposed to come from the develop, developed world to the developing world has still not showed up. Let's at least reform the multilaterals to make some of that happen. Now, technology transfer is a little bit harder because most technology is developed by private companies and therefore is commercial in nature. You can't just ask governments to transfer it that easily. And then, as I said, thirdly, uh, let countries have much more ambition around their own climate targets. So I think if if the prime minister can move G20 countries in that direction and really put in very strong language in the final communique around some of these issues, I think that will create a lot more moral pressure on the world as a whole to move faster uh, in this area. So I think that's what I'd be really keen to see happening. And the prime minister certainly seems seized of this issue quite quite well. Right. Uh, one uh, one more question, if I were to ask you about the infrastructure deal that was discussed uh, between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden yesterday. This was a railway and port deal being discussed between Saudi Arabia, UAE, US and India. How significant this infrastructure deal would be, according to you, and uh, how would it be a counter to the Belt and Road Initiative of China, the importance of this uh, deal for all our economies put together for a shared future? Yeah, Parikshit, I haven't seen the details, of course, of that deal because it is very recent. But I can tell you one thing, that connectivity with places like the UAE and Saudi Arabia can be very important, uh, certainly uh, in terms of uh, electricity, because, you know, they are countries that have uh, sun at a time when India's evening peak is coming up. So if we can actually create con better connectivity on the transmission infrastructure side, then we can actually have a situation where you can have electricity moving from India to those countries and vice versa uh, to really take advantage of the movement of the sun. And that really is a core theme, if you recall, of the Prime Minister's One World, One Sun, One Grid uh, initiative as well. So I think it can really move for us forward in that direction. Now, maybe the US can help again with technology and with financing to make some of those connectivities happen. Uh, I, you know, obviously having better port infrastructure and creating shipping lanes will again be really good for trade, uh, you know, multilateral and bilateral trade between all of these countries. So I think it's pointing in that direction. Uh, I think on the railway side, I'm not clear. Perhaps it is really meant to get more high speed, uh, you know, technology, high speed train technology into countries like India. Uh, but again, I haven't seen the fine, uh, fine print and the details on that. So hard for me to comment. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Suman Sinha, for joining us, sharing your perspective on uh, the big G20 meeting, which is now truly underway in the national capital. All eyes, the international media, and let me tell you, there are at least 3,000 journalists from all around the world here, and everyone is looking out for big headlines. Everyone wants to see whether there will be a communique or not. Thanks once again, Suman Sinha.